previous examples of stoichiometry, we looked at um, examples where one reagent was used in excess, and we automatically knew what is called the limiting reagent. So now we want to talk about what a limiting reagent is. And one way we can do that is thinking about something a little bit more practical than chemicals. But you'll find out soon that it works the exact same way for chemicals. So here we have the product of this reaction between bread and American cheese as a grilled cheese sandwich. And we can think about how one of the two reactants or reagents can limit the amount of grilled cheese sandwiches that we can make. So let's think about it. If we have an entire loaf of bread, but only a single slice of cheese, we can only make one grilled cheese sandwich, assuming that one grilled cheese sandwich is two slices of bread and a piece of cheese. No matter how much extra bread we have, if we only have one slice of cheese, we can't make any more grilled cheese sandwiches. On the other hand, we could have a situation where we have an entire package of cheese and only two slices of bread. Again, no matter how much extra cheese that we have, we can't make any more grilled cheese sandwiches because each one requires two slices of bread. So in this situation, either the bread or the cheese can be the limiting reagent. And in the case of having two slices of bread and an entire package of cheese, your bread would be gone. You'd have excess cheese, but you'd still only have one grilled cheese sandwich. And in the other case where you have the whole loaf of bread and only one slice of cheese, you'd have bread left over, but you'd still only have one grilled cheese sandwich. It's the exact same thing in chemistry. In chemistry, one of the reactants or the other can run out first. And if that happens, then you can't make any more of the product. So let's look at this as an example where we have actual chemicals. And to do that, like usual, I'm going to switch over to the lecture notes. Uh, so I'm just going to write. Okay, so let's assume that we have this reaction. Methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide plus water. And this is a combustion reaction. And you know that the first thing you do is balance the chemical equation. To balance a combustion reaction, we do carbon, then hydrogen, then oxygen. All of the carbon goes into carbon dioxide. So one and one, we're good. All of the hydrogen goes into water. So for here, we need two waters because each water has two hydrogens. And then we have two plus two or four oxygens. So we need two O2s. So now let's assume that we start with 64.0 grams of CH4 and 104 grams of oxygen. So we start with these two amounts of methane and oxygen. And what we want to know is how much water we can make. So we're looking to figure out how much water we can make. So this is our goal. So just like the grilled cheese sandwich example, where we had to figure out if we were running out of cheese or we were running out of bread, we need to figure out, are we going to run out of methane or are we going to run out of oxygen first? In order to do that, we need to figure out how much water we can make with all of our methane and how much water we can make with all of our oxygen. Whichever one is left, or whichever one is less, that reactant will be gone because that's all of it. So let's take a look at how we would do that. So this is very similar to the previous um, questions. We just have to do it twice. So if we look here as our plan of attack for methane, we want to convert from grams of CH4 to moles of CH4 to moles of H2O to grams of H2O. So starting with 64.0 grams of CH4 times. Well, to go from grams to moles, we need the molar mass. We need 4 times 1.01 plus 12.01, which is 16.05 grams of CH4 in the bottom. On top, 1 mole of CH4 times. Now we need to go from moles of one thing to moles of another. Always, when you're going from moles of one thing to moles of another, you need a balanced chemical equation. In this case, we have one mole of CH4 on the bottom, and on top, two moles of H2O. 
Then finally, we want to convert from moles of water to grams of water. Well, to do that, we need the molar mass. So we put one mole of water on the bottom, and we add two hydrogens, 2.02 plus 16.00, which is 18.02 grams of water on the top. Multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat, repeat, repeat until you're done. And to, 306, uh, to three significant figures, we get 144 grams of water. So if we react all of our methane, we will make 144 grams of water. Now we need to figure out what will happen if we react all of our oxygen. So in this case, the plan of attack is to go from grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen to moles of water, and then finally to grams of water. So starting with 104 grams of oxygen times. First thing we want to do is put the molar mass of oxygen on the bottom. Note that it's O2, so we don't want to put 16. We want to put 32.00 grams of oxygen. And on top, one mole of oxygen times. Now we're going from moles of one thing to moles of another using a balanced chemical equation. Well, we want oxygen on the bottom, and the stoichiometric coefficient is 2. So we put 2 moles of oxygen on the bottom. On the top, we want 2 moles of water. Finally, we're going from moles of water to grams of water. If you notice, we were doing that exact same thing in the previous example. So since we're doing the exact same conversion, we can use the exact same conversion factor. So in another way, copy this down. One mole of water on the bottom and the 18.02 grams of water on the top. And when you do that, you find that you can make 58.6, I put a two, but I'm going to six, 58.6 grams of water. So if we react all of our methane, we can make 144 grams of water. If we react all of our oxygen, we can only make 58.6 grams of water. So we're going to make 58.6 grams of water. This is called the theoretical yield. And this is the lower of the two numbers. Why? Because this involved using all of our oxygen. So now there's no more oxygen. After we make 58.6 grams of water, we've used all of our oxygen. No oxygen left, no more water. And that's basically how this works. Oxygen, the chemical O2, is referred to as the limiting reactant or limiting reagent. Both are used. So in this case, oxygen is a limiting reagent, and 58.6 grams is the theoretical yield. Now there's something else to note. Notice, we started with more oxygen than we did methane. There's no shortcut way to do this. Unfortunately, you can't just look at these amounts and say, oh, there's less methane, so therefore we'll make less water. Notice that 64 grams of methane gave me 144 grams of water, while 104 grams of oxygen only gave me 58.6 grams of water. So that's just basically the way that it works. You have to do all of this to figure out the theoretical yield and the limiting reagent. Now another thing along these lines that chemists like to calculate is the percent yield. Because some reactions are efficient and other reactions are not as efficient. And sometimes we do inefficient reactions because we simply don't know a better way. But one way that we can look at the efficiency of a reaction is something called the percent yield. So the percent yield. The percent yield is like any other percentage. It's the part divided by the whole. It's the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Now, in a lecture course, in textbook, or on Alex, for example, usually your percent yield is less than 100. In the lab, though, sometimes your percentage yield is greater than 100 because your product's wet and you're considering water as your product or whatever the case may be. Um, there's other stuff there, whether it's solvent or starting material or whatever, that adds to the mass, which can actually make your yield greater than 100. 
but usually yields are somewhere between 0 and 100%. In the lecture book and in the um, Alex, you'll be given the actual yield. In the lab, you'll take your product, put it on a balance, and you'll measure the actual yield. So the actual yield is something that we can measure. So let's do an example with percent yield. Let's say that we have hydrogen gas plus nitrogen gas yields ammonia gas. And you know the first thing you need to do is balance the chemical equation. So in order to balance this, what we need to do is we need to notice that we have two nitrogens here, so we're going to need at least two ammonias, and that gives us two times three or six hydrogens, which means we need three H2. So in this case, let's say we start with um, 3.62 grams of hydrogen, and we add that to 6.85 grams of of nitrogen. And when we're done, we find that we make the actual yield is equal to 7.14 grams of NH3. So that's our actual yield. So now we need to figure out how good did we do? If we mix this amount of this and this amount of this, and that's our actual yield, what's our percentage yield? Which again is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Well, in order to do that, we need to figure out our theoretical yield just like we did in the previous example. So for hydrogen, we want to go from grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen to moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia. And this will give us our um, the amount we can make with all of our hydrogen. So starting with 3.62 grams of hydrogen times, we want the molar mass on the bottom. Hydrogen is H2, so 2 times 1.01, which is 2.02 .02 grams of hydrogen. On top, 1 mole of hydrogen. For the next step, we want to use the balanced chemical equation. We want moles of hydrogen on the bottom to cancel out, and if we look at the balanced chemical equation, we want three moles of hydrogen. And on top, we're trying to find ammonia, so we want two moles of ammonia. Then finally, we want to convert it to grams of ammonia, one mole of NH3, it's 14.01 plus one, uh, 3 times 1.01, which is 17.04 grams of NH3. Multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat, 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 rounding the three sig figs, we get 20.4 grams of ammonia. So if we react all of our hydrogen, we will form 20.4 grams of ammonia. That may or may not be the amount of ammonia we make. We need to figure out how much ammonia we can make with all of our nitrogen to figure out our limiting reagent and our theoretical yield. So to do this for nitrogen, we do the same thing. Grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia. Starting with 6.85 grams of nitrogen times, well, Nitrogen's N2, so we take the 14.01 and we double it, 28.02 grams of nitrogen, and on top, one mole of nitrogen, times, now we're going from moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia, we use the balanced chemical equation, one mole of nitrogen on the bottom, two moles of ammonia on top, and then the last step's the same, because we're going from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia, moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia, so one mole of NH3 on the bottom, and 17.04 grams of NH3 on the top. Multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat until you're done, and you end up with 8.33 grams of ammonia. So, 
If we use all of our hydrogen, we make 20.4 grams of ammonia. If we use all of our nitrogen, we make 8.33 grams of ammonia. Since all of our nitrogen gives us less ammonia, and therefore will be gone, this is our theoretical yield. Because once we make 8.33 grams of ammonia, we have no nitrogen left. We can't make any more ammonia. Nitrogen is the limiting reagent. Now, finally, we want to find the percentage yield. Now, the actual yield was given to us in the problem, and the theoretical yield is here. Now we can do the math. So the percent yield equals the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Well, in this case, the actual yield is given to us in the problem, 7.14 grams. The theoretical yield is 8.33 grams times 100. Rounding to three sig figs, we get 85.7% yield. So this is how you can find the percentage yield if you're given the actual yield. Notice that we had to find the limiting region in this case, just like in the previous example. So limiting reagent is extremely important um, and something you definitely need to calculate. The good news is, even though it's a lot of steps because you have to do it twice, it's very good practice for what you learned in the previous section because you're essentially doing it two times to solve one of these problems.